Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today we're talking about land race gardening and how to adapt your garden and plants to local conditions. So if you're wanting to have a garden that produces a harvest way more consistently each year, then land race gardening might be what you're looking for. It's definitely gaining popularity with people that are into permaculture and also homesteaders and even backyard hobbyists and uh, novice plant breeders as well. So you might be thinking to start with, Emma, what is a land race? Um, And I didn't know what a land race was either until I did a little bit of digging. And a land race is a local cultivar or a variety of plant that is adapted to grow in the local conditions and uh, the local climate. And it includes things like the temperatures and the soil. So they thrive in the region and they often grow or harvest a lot more quickly and they germinate so much faster than, you know, some of the other seeds, even, you know, heirlooms or hybrid seeds. And a land race vegetable or fruit has a huge amount of genetic diversity in it, which means that there are a lot of differences from plant to plant or the fruit that are produced. And it's an advantage because the plants adapt to changes that happen in the climate each year, right? So have you ever had like a super long cold wet spring or maybe a super cold winter with like eight feet of snow? Um, What about a drought and scorching summer sun? Like last year was a great example for us here in Utah. We had like a really cold start to the spring and everything we've kind of noticed in the last four years has kind of been like a month behind from what it normally is. Um, and this year is no exception either. So usually um, the hardest or the coldest part of the winter and the most snow happens in January. Well, the last couple of years, it's been happening in February. And what would normally happen in February is you have this thing called the February thaw where everything would get warm again and you know even trees and stuff would start to leaf out a bit but then it would get super cold again and we maybe get another couple of snows and usually like around my dad's birthday in May so like the first week of May we would have like an extra snowstorm that would happen and then that would be it for the season like the next day it would be you know warm and you know spring weather um so there's there's definitely like variations that happen from a weather perspective but also there's going to be changes that happen in your local you know climate from um you know not necessarily from a weather perspective but also things like you might get um an influx of you know, more pests, or there might be a prevalence of diseases. So one year, um, we had an issue with um, powdery mildew, and we had loads of powdery mildew on everything like our peas or beans our squashes there was just there was just loads of it going on um and then the year before that we had like a over you know abundance of these crickets which the chickens absolutely loved they loved going nuts on these crickets um but you know there there are differences that happen year after year and a land race plant basically adapts to these changes year after year and that means that you're going to be more successful with the harvest each year no matter what those conditions that mother nature is going to be throwing at it so what is land race gardening well if you're already busy um and I get it, believe me, I'm also super busy. Um, You know, I work full time as well as running um, a blog and a podcast and a YouTube channel and all that good stuff. And, you know, I've got a family (laughs) and three doggies and stuff to look after as well. So there's, there's a lot going on. So I totally understand it. And land race gardening really appeals to people that are, you know, busy because, It's a gardening method where survival of the fittest in your garden is what is going to reign supreme. And land race gardening works with nature and the natural order of pollen moving between plants, right? So um, you get bees and other pollinating insects or the wind that move the pollen from, you know, 
plan A to plan B. And that's what helps kind of share the the genetics between the plants, right? And the, the wonderful thing about land race gardening is it means that you can grow from seed saved from the best plants in your garden. So the ones that still, you know, produced and, you know, did well despite everything that Mother Nature is throwing at it. And you basically save that seed from those good plants and sow the next year and save those seeds. And it keeps, you know, the cycle keeps going on. Now, you don't just want to be saving the seed from, um, you know, the plants that, that do well in those growing conditions. Obviously, you want to include those, but you also want to include those that you absolutely love the taste of or the colour or the texture or the shape. All those things you want to be saving seed from and then mixing it all up and then sowing it again in the next year. So land race gardening is much more traditional way of gardening and you know, for for me, that one of the wonderful things and something that I got really excited about is that you can happily grow multiple varieties of a plant, and you don't need to worry about spacing and isolation to maintain those true to type seeds, like what we have to do if you're wanting to grow heirloom seeds. So if you want to grow you know, an heirloom variety of something, you need to really be careful about what you're growing nearby and understand, is that going to cross-pollinate? So, for example, if I've got two kale varieties that are, um, you know, starting to flower, they might cross-pollinate with each other if they are the same species. So there's, there's a couple of different species of kale, for example. Um, there's Brassica oleraceae and there's Brassica napa. And the, the napa variety and the oleraceae typically don't cross-pollinate with each other, typically. They might, um, but typically they, they don't. Um, so you could grow those two different types of, you know, kale next to each other. However, there's other plants that are within that family of Brassica oleaceae and Brassica napa, which would cross-pollinate with each other. So in the Brassica oleaceae, uh, variety, for example, that would be the Cavallo Nero or the Toscana kale or the uh, the dinosaur kale, as it's known, um, that will quite happily uh, cross pollinate with uh, Brussels sprouts, which are also in that same family uh, and broccoli, for example. And um, sometimes that can work in your favour and sometimes not so. So if you were doing a land race gardening, that would be OK that those things are all kind of crossing together because that's diversifying that gene pool and adding more genetics to it. So you're going to find things that are going to change and evolve each year that you're growing these things out. And you're going to get some, you know, really interesting shapes and sizes, colours, textures. There's going to be you know, quite a cornucopia of different things that are happening each year that those plants are being grown out. But if you're wanting to only grow that one type, so if you're only wanting to be growing that, you know, dinosaur kale, then you need to be really careful about what else is going to be going to seed, not just in your garden, but maybe in your neighbor's garden or maybe in the farm that's, you know, less than half a mile away because, you know, for some plants, they need huge distances um, to be truly isolated, you know, from being cross pollinated. And, you know, things like tomatoes, you can get away with like maybe five feet to, you know, keep those uh, seed types pure um, and keep those varieties as you would be expecting for an heirloom seed. Um, but some other varieties like squashes, uh, watermelons, for example, need a huge amount of space um, to ensure that they are not being cross-pollinated because, you know, the bees are, that are pollinating one variety aren't going to be then flying, you know, 
three miles away or whatever the the spacing distance is um to then go pollinate those and i mean in in my small garden i mean i say it's a small garden i've got just under a quarter of an acre but i don't dedicate the whole thing to um growing veggies i i guess i could <laughs> but i don't um but having a, a beehive on there means i'm much more likely to be having some cross-pollination issues that with uh, multiple varieties that are going there so that's just something to think about and land race gardening is really a great method for short season and high altitudes as well as areas that have got um, large changes in temperatures or in seasons because you're going to be able to really niche down and get some great adaptable plants that are going to be able to take on whatever is thrown their way but it's not limited to those types of climates you can really start land race gardening anywhere that you're living and that's the wonderful thing about land race gardening is you know you really can do it anywhere because the climate and conditions in your garden are going to be different to your neighbors even though you're in the same neighborhood there are different nuances in each garden and different microclimates that happen um you know even from a year-to-year basis um so there are going to be differences and there's definitely some advantages in doing this and you know if you're a scientist like i am there's there's just something that kind of really calls to you know the core of your being in being able to you know really truly experiment and see what what kind of comes out of those experiments year to year and test it again and again and just see you know what else is going to happen this time so it's it's a really fascinating um, method of gardening and something that I've definitely started to do a little bit more of each year in uh, our garden and we did it for kale and a lot of the brassicas that we had um, <clears throat> in our garden. They they were all flowering. They were all being pollinated by the bees. And uh, there's, there's a video um, that I put up on YouTube about different plants to, to grow. Um, I should link that up in the show notes, actually, so you guys can check it out. And there's, there's a video of these bees just kind of pootling between all these plants and all these flowers and they're all like the same flower to the bee um so she's just there doing her job um pollinating these things harvesting nectar harvesting pollen and you know pootling back to the hive um but you know those plants that i'm going to be growing out this year oh i can't wait to see what those are gonna gonna look like so that's that's really exciting to me um, but there's some of the benefits of land race gardening, other than if you're a science nerd. Um, I probably should have gone into botany thinking of it now rather than being a chemist. Um, but here's, here's some other good reasons that you might want to try your hand at land race gardening. So first of all, it's probably more reliable um, harvests that are going to be happening. And your plants are going to be establishing quicker. And if your plants are establishing quicker, guess what? That means that there's going to be less space for weeds to grow. So you might end up with fewer weeds too there's also reduced cost in seeds now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how to start land race gardening and there is going to be some level of initial cost in uh, getting the seeds and we'll talk a little bit about how you can get some uh, cheaper or reduced costs coming in and um, you know talk about how to how to start doing that and um, there's also some stress resistance that you're going to be building in with um, the development of your land race so you're going to be having um plants that are resistant to things like climate changes temperature changes you know they're they're not necessarily going to keel over at the the first little frost that you get some might um you know but some might stand up so much better same with the heat um you know differences in the amount of water um pests diseases all that stuff you're going to be building that resilience in which is fantastic let nature do the work there's also no isolating varieties for seed saving and here's the great bit if you're a busy gardener there's less input from the gardener and because you can select plants that are growing well in your pre-existing soil conditions using the method of gardening how you water like all of that the the land race um that you're developing not only adjusts to the climates but also adjusts to the gardener right so that's pretty pretty neat 
So how do you start a land race garden? Well, scouring through the internet and reading about gardening, there's, I mean, there seems to be two types of gardener, right? You've got the gardeners that grow the hybrids or, you know, the seeds that you have to purchase every year to keep growing the same one when you've run out of the seed. And you've got the heirloom gardener. We don't really seem to talk about the people that grow both hybrids and heirlooms and you know there's there's advantages to to doing both because you're going to get a more consistent harvest uh, but i'm i'm one of those those fence gardeners right i i grow a bit of both so i've got f1 hybrids of some carrots because we've had some really terrible uh results with growing carrots <laughs> it's probably more the gardener than the garden or the seed um but then, you know, we've also got some great heirlooms that we grow consistently. So we always grow purple Cherokee um, tomatoes. We always grow purple top Milan uh, turnips. There's, there's a bunch that we're doing. And I'm, I've bought even more heirlooms, uh, seeds to try, which I was really exci- excited to find. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a in an upcoming episode um when those arrive which will hopefully be soon um but you know there's this um you know some really great things that you can bring and you know really kind of marrying those two um you know benefits of those two types of seed and when it comes to starting a land race you need to not necessarily be thinking of the terms of you know hybrids and heirlooms but thinking in terms of expanding the gene pool and bringing in diversity so developing locally adapted land race varieties takes a few seasons of seed saving and replanting but it's really worth the effort when you've got a resilient garden and a reliable harvest year after year growing just the one thing or a a clone um like potatoes potatoes are all clones because you're growing the tubers year after year uh, same with sunchokes technically but when you're growing something that you know is is kind of um it's a small gene pool size because it's been inbred so much it really runs the risk of crop failure very very quickly and if you're wanting to make sure that you know if you're growing food for you and your family or maybe you're supporting a local food bank um you know your friends you know maybe you're planning like this super you know straight garden to table kind of harvest party um something like that you really want to make sure that you're going to be able to have something that you're actually going to be able to harvest right and you know I've I've seen it I grew two different types of corn one year one variety did really well one variety did terribly um, and I'm still trying to figure out like the type of corn that's going to be growing really well in my garden um, I've grown glass gem corn it's been the only successful one that I've grown and yes that was a that's an heirloom I tried a hybrid variety of com, did not do very well. It got kind of decimated by crickets. Um, Painting mountain corn didn't do so well for me. It was like very spotty in its pollination. And the minute that I got a strong wind through, it just kind of flattened everything out. I've also grown atomic orange corn, which was another uh, heirloom, I think and that one again it was really spotty pollination and i got maybe one cob out of like 30 seeds that was really disappointing um plants came up but didn't didn't pollinate very well and i grew the coolie corn which is like a black um anthocyanin rich corn and i got a couple of cobs out of that but they they went moldy um so you know at the minute the glass gem corn seems to be the only one that seems to be working for me um so having you know a case of where you can you know really think of those things that did well in the garden and being able to bring those kind of um traits back year after year to then develop and create something new um is very very exciting and you know the key thing to starting your land race garden project is that you really need to start out with a bunch of different varieties and you plant them out a few feet apart so you can kind of really see what's what's going on there um i mean if you've got the space you want to plant out as many as you can um because the more seeds that you're going to get out there the 
better um, your diversity is going to be uh, and that you're going to have a healthier gene pool population um, and helps kind of reduce that inbreeding problem. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure you label those plantings so you know what they are and take plenty of notes in a garden journal so i mean you're really looking to know which are which varieties are duds for your area like those that are not growing very well like for me that i've got that um atomic orange con and the painted mountain con like those those varieties did not do well for me they might be ones that i would want to give away on a seed swap so somebody else can try them and see if they work for them or because we're planning on moving, it might be something that I just want to kind of keep in my seed bank for the minute until we move to our new property and then I can grow those out because it's going to be a totally different climate from what I'm here in Utah. Um, it's going to be a lot more moisture and we're going to see, you know, how those varieties fare out there and if they grow well great maybe the glass gem con won't grow so well when we move um but having that kind of kicking about in a seed bank's gonna be a good a good backup and if they don't grow there okay we'll donate them to a um you know a, a seed swap and try something new so that's that's the good thing like even though you know we're having to you know take some level of investment at the beginning you know we can still you know share those out and share them with our friends or neighbors or even strangers and uh, you know really kind of help spread you know growing different varieties around um, you know the not just the, the country but the planet too so it is definitely um, best to keep good notes when it comes to this because we're going to want to to know how we created our land race garden and i'm going to just kind of segue a little bit and talk a little bit about the types of seeds because we've got to start our land race with a bunch of different varieties um we should talk about you know getting the seeds so heirlooms have what's known as genetic depression also known as inbreeding depression okay and it means that they've been inbred for generations and sometimes lack the ability to adapt to stresses so they're often more susceptible to pests, disease climatic changes you know they need a bit of pampering not just a bit of pampering they, they can need a lot of pampering um but they can be a great source of genes for traits that you love like flavor for example or colors and shapes right heirlooms are so amazing you know in their diversity and they've fallen out of favor from a commercial um perspective in farming because they don't often ship very well so you know there's there's some clear you know downsides to growing heirlooms but there's also some clear benefits to growing them and hybrids like those that you see with f1 on the seed packet or in the catalog they offer some additional traits like disease resistance or growing more uniformly um, ripening at the same time those kind of things and although growing out seed from saved from these hybrids is usually nothing like the original hybrid you grew it's often more like the grandparent of um or the the parent of the hybrid that you grow plant breeders often cross these grown out hybrid seeds with other varieties and then they work to stabilize that variety and that creates new varieties to grow and some of these new varieties or cultivars might actually become heirlooms in the next 50 years or so and there's some great plant breeders out there that have done some amazing work in creating some really cool um varieties like carol depp's a, a plant breeder that comes to mind and she's done this oregon sweet meat um squash that's like a, a hubbard um and it's it's pretty good there's there's been loads of um great you know feedback about that variety there's also her candy stick delicata squash which is so much more sweeter than a normal um squash and you know there's just just so many cool things that you can do and you know plant breeding in itself is kind of you know it's ticking all those science boxes for me so it's something that i'm kind of keen to learn a bit more about but um you know hybrids themselves offer some additional traits that you know your heirlooms don't grow and that's the key thing to take away 
And plants in a landrace garden avoid this problem with gene depression or uh, inbreeding depression because they're allowed to cross pollinate, which makes them become genetically diverse. Okay, the cross pollination creates naturally occurring hybrids, and you know I'll say that again, they are naturally occurring hybrids, and this happens in nature. So people that are telling you that you know hybrids are bad and they're GMO. It's not, okay, a hybrid is not the same as a GMO and hybridization happens in nature. It is how nature works, okay? Corn is pollinated by wind, okay? If you get corn that's ripening on one field that falls over to another field that is you know, just starting to um, push out the, the female parts, but the male parts aren't pollinate, like aren't producing the pollen yet, and you're going to get pollinization that's happening in that other field, and it's occurring naturally, okay? I don't know why people are so scared of hybrids. I, I really don't. Um, I guess it's the, the weird propaganda, I guess, that's been kind of spread about them. But just, just know that, you know, these things happen naturally. It's okay. You're not going to be growing like a, a third arm or anything like that. It happens naturally. And, you know, these naturally occurring cross pollinations produce plants that have like exceptionally vigorous growth the next year and it's known as hybrid vigor and you, you'll see it as you start to sow your seed again those seeds come up like the clappers they come up so quickly and you know they're often very quick to you know start setting fruit or developing and you know that those will be some of your stronger plants and then we'll go again and we'll save those seeds again and we'll be saving like an f2 hybrid so the next generation and it's at this stage that f2 stage that's when we start seeing some really interesting diversity happening when it comes to the types of plants that are being produced and squashes and corn and stuff like that are some of the easiest things to see that with because you'll see all these different you know color combinations shape combinations and sizes it's really quite quite exciting but there are some key watch outs to be successful with land race gardening and that you need to make sure number one that you don't include um, varieties that are uh, patent protected so they might have a pvp on them or a um like a they usually say on the seed packet that they're not um to be saved like no seed saving and stuff like that because they're a patented variety that's protected um so if you're not sure um because i mean lots of people use fruits or veggies from the grocery store um you know don't don't include it because we want to we want to make sure we stay legal and some companies take their patented gene sequences very very seriously i'm sure you guys know who who we're talking about <laughs> when it comes to that so you know if in doubt leave it out uh, you also want to skip using commercial F1 hybrids of beets, broccoli, cabbage and the cabbage family. So turnips, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, bok choy, um, all that good stuff. Uh, carrots, cauliflower, radishes, sunflowers and onions in your land race development. And that's because these plants have what's known as cytoplasmic male sterility. And it causes problems with the seed production in the following generations. And it shows up when those plants flower as no anthers in the flowers or fused anthers or no pollen or very little pollen. OK, and the anthers are basically like the, the fine kind of filament structures kind of like hairs um that are covered in pollen if you ever see like a, a lily that's open you can see those anthers very clearly there are the little spikes that come up with like a little bead on the end that's covered in pollen okay and you know if you're wanting to create your land race for some of these plants you know beets cabbage family carrots cauliflower radish sunflowers onions um you want to be sticking with open pollinated seeds um or heirlooms um maybe more towards the heirlooms is sometimes open pollinated um they can have some problems with this uh, male sterility trait coming in and what you're looking for is when when these plants flower check 
as soon as you can, as soon as you can, check that the flowers have got anthers on them and check that they've got pollen by lightly brushing your finger over it and you'll see like pollen on your finger um, and then pull out any plants that don't have pollen because you don't want to um, encourage that trait into the genetics that you're trying to develop with your land race. Um, another way to check for it is to um, see where the bees are in uh, the pollinating insects are going, okay? Bees are not going to waste their time on plants that they're not going to get a benefit from, okay? Um, so bees, like, don't... They, they know that a plant's been um, visited by a bee and they don't go back to it. It's really quite fascinating how, how they work. But you want to be looking for the plants that bees are all over, because they are most likely got the more nectar in there and the more pollen. And one of the other traits that you'll see um, with this kind of male sterility trait is there's a lot less nectar that's in these um, these flowers. So you'll see like fewer bees and pollinating insects on them. So um, it's it's a good idea if you if you find that you have that issue, pull out those plants that don't have. Um, the pollen and you know try something try something else okay the, the key here is you know just because a plant's not working you know don't take it to heart and feel like you're you're a failure the whole point of this is you know we're wanting to be selecting plants that are adapting to our conditions that are tasting great you know they've got the right you know looks that you're looking for maybe they've got the capability that you're looking for you know for storage things you know so don't never feel bad that you're pulling out a plant it's it's not a waste i mean if you can eat it go nuts eat it um you know or feed it to the chickens or whatnot but you can always put these things in the compost bin right there's there's never waste on a homestead even if it's in the suburbs and you know these plants that aren't working for you and you can't eat them or give them to the chickens put them in the compost bin because they're still going to feed the soil and they're going to feed your you know your plants in you know the months to come so don't don't worry that things don't work so let's talk a bit about sources of seed right so i said that the key to this is uh you need a, a you know a number of different varieties that we're gonna get in the ground together and one of the easiest ways to do it is stocking up on seed packets at the end of the season they're on sale they're discounted um that's that's a great way to get different varieties Although you are somewhat limited in the varieties that are going to be there, right? And a lot of them will be um, F1. Uh, but you might get lucky and find a bunch of heirlooms and open pollinated. Um, you can also add um, things from the grocery store or from the farmer's market produce. Um, I'm seeing a lot more grocery stores now are carrying local varieties or locally grown varieties and certainly in the two grocery stores near me they actually put the variety on the container uh, which is quite quite cool if you've never read uh, the label on some of the package stuff uh, it's quite eye-opening um, so sometimes you can find the variety it's obviously much easier at a farmer's market because number one you know it's local number two you can meet the grower and uh, the the benefit of meeting the grower of course is you can ask questions about what the variety is so if you really like it well there's some some seeds that you can save uh, more bang for your buck there right um it's it's pretty easy to save seed from um you know produce from the farmer's market for things like tomatoes peppers melons squash watermelon right super easy to do that um you can also get seeds from a seed swap uh take take a look online try try doing some searches for a local seed swap there there will be some um sometimes they happen like around march certainly in my area they happen around March sometimes they're on the other end um so I found there was an online um seed swap that was happening but they actually uh, happen in December so take a look around and see what you can find if not set up your own seed swap and uh you know get the ball rolling on on that you can also try asking you know gardening friends and neighbors that live nearby who tend to save seed um because those seeds are going to be well on the way to actually being adapted right uh, which is always a good thing. Although where I live, I there isn't any neighbours really that grow a garden. Um, definitely 
you know, some, <laughs> um, you know, they just kind of tend to go to the big box store, buy the starts and, and grow a garden. That's, that's great. That's fine. That works. That works perfectly for them. Um, but if you're brand spanking new to gardening or you just straight up don't want to ask your neighbors, um, then that's cool. Don't worry. I get it. I don't know my neighbors very well either. Um, and some great places to start are seed suppliers that are part of the open source seed initiative. Okay. So these are open source seed initiative is um, that the, the plant genes that are in there are not able to be patented okay they're a, a free for use um kind of deal kind of like software um so you can you can take these seeds you can breed these seeds you can grow them save the seed you can do what you want with them which is really awesome um and there's, there's a bunch of um, different companies that um, are part of that. You can look on the Open Source Seed Initiative website. They've got a list of them all there. Um, I can also put a list of some um, some of them that are um, on the blog post. I can link to, to the blog post um, or, uh, you know, you can just check check some out you can check out your favorite online seed suppliers too and see if they're part um of the open source seed initiative or ossi and you might even see that sometimes in the catalogs they designate varieties that are um ossi in there so that's something that you might want to consider starting with okay other great places to start are um heirloom seed suppliers there's a bunch of these online now which is fantastic um you know it really opens up the possibilities of what you can really try uh, i just will say with a word of caution though is to you know kind of consider um where some of these heirlooms are being grown and whether they they work for your climate so you know there's, there's some really neat heirlooms that i really want to grow um but they're down in like the southwest so kind of phoenix tucson way on they're not gonna you know they're probably not gonna grow very well for where i live um so as much as i really would like to try those seeds i don't think it's it's going to be um a financially viable experiment to try it this this time so you can start with some of the basic ones that um you know are well recommended by lots of the gardeners that they've had success with if you're really not sure where to start for heirloom seeds and you know grow some of those dependent varieties or those best sellers or customer favorites you know more often than not these online seed suppliers are able to kind of like categorize their stuff and you can sort by the most popular which is pretty neat now you know you're not kind of having to you know skim through all those catalogs and try and find out which ones are customer favorites by reading everything you can just sort 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 them all now which is pretty cool um and that's a great place to start now when it comes to planting them you want to prepare your garden bed just as you normally would right if you're you know starting your plants okay because you know just just like normal plants that you're growing you know they're going to do a lot better if you have the right soil okay so i like to add the compost some worm castings if you're digging your soil dig it over i like to add in some azomite rock dust and kelp meal to help boost the minerals that are in the soil because i've got sand um you know you still want the plants to be nutritious because even if you're pulling out things that are not working very well or they're kind of puny looking and stuff you know you're still gonna want, want them to be somewhat delicious to eat right um and then the next step in starting up your land raised garden is to to watch your plants grow and you want to keep an eye on the seeds that are germinating first and flourishing right off the bat right anything that's slow to germinate looks puny spindly is being overrun by the weeds next to it you really want to consider pulling that from the bed okay so just just get it out of there it's it's not going to be doing anything for you at this point what you're wanting is the best of the best right and you know not that I'm biased because my husband's a former marine, but you're looking for the marines of the plant world, right? When it comes to creating your land race, okay, you want you want in the the seeds and the plants that are getting in there, they're getting established, and then they're thriving on minimum support and input, okay? So that, that's what you need to be thinking when you're developing this. You know, you're you're looking for varieties that are thriving with little input, right? 
And the whole point of the gardening method is really to just kind of leave them be, you know, have kind of minimum input from you as the gardener. Because we're wanting to select seeds from the plants that are growing well despite of adverse conditions in the garden. So, you know, if you've got problems with drought or prolonged wet weather, cold, heat, weeds, pests, diseases, all that stuff, right? You don't want to be pampering your plants because it becomes really difficult to see if those plants are actually, you know, a survival of the fit situation and they are better than the rest of those or that they're just responding to your tender loving care and nurturing it's okay to tend to them a bit you know a little bit of watering and weeding you know maybe feeding them like you would for the first couple of years so you can have some assurance of getting a good yield at harvest time but you know you want to be kind of you know, weaning them off that so you can keep notes on, you know, the growing conditions and how you've been gardening and how you've been feeding so you can really see, you know, how different the varieties are growing. And I'll give you an example. So we've grown two different types of turnips side by side and they were both heirloom varieties. One was called Golden Globe, the other is this Purple Top Milan. And the Golden Globe was always smaller. It was longer to germinate, fewer germinated. Um, it just took ages to get established. Whereas the Purple Top ones were just pumping out like there was no tomorrow. So my Purple Top Milans are like are my Marines and you know the the golden globes or whoever kind of rolls in like the couple of months after that so th there's just a lot of differences even between plants that are in the same the same species and you know the golden globe turnips were good but they took a lot of nurturing and a lot of checking in on them i was feeding them more just doing everything i could to to get them to you know a level of a yield and it just it just wasn't really working for us so we don't grow them anymore um so really keep good notes about how you're growing and the the different varieties and how they're growing too we've also had um different plants it was peas where they were consistently being eaten by pill bugs and then we put in those king tut peas and they they grew boy did they grow and they didn't have any problems with you know being constantly eaten by the pill bugs or slugs or anything and they just kept on churning out peas like it was cool like there was no tomorrow which was pretty awesome Right, I hope you guys are still with me. This is a longer episode, um, but I hope that you're getting a lot of value out of this. So the next step in your land race garden is harvesting, right? And that's always the exciting thing for a gardener is harvest time. And you really do need to eat some of the plant that, to see if you like the flavour or texture. Um, if you can you know, at least save a little bit of it so you can keep the seed, um, you know, that, that's great um, because you want to be able to grow out some of that the next year. But you want to eat some of the plants and see if you like the colour, the flavour, the texture, how it cooks, right? Um, some plants you might find have like some really horrible flavours or textures, right? They, they might, I don't know, like have no flavour at all or really bitter notes to them. Um, and those plants you're obviously not going to want to save the seed from and you know you can eliminate those from your seed collection and seed saving for that year you might also want to assess other characteristics like how well the plant stores so for example if you've got a winter squash and you've got one that's got a thick hard skin that you know means that it survived you know the mice and voles in your garden um, but it also meant that it stored all the way through winter and well into spring before it started going bad that might be a really good contender for you to save the seed from because it's got that long you know storage capability which means that you know you've got a potential crop there as a food source that you don't need to you know have to faff about with canning and freezing and you know all that good stuff that comes hand in hand with harvest time so you're wanting to really save seeds from a number of different plants because you're going to help keep um, a diverse gene pool like if you save seed from only one plant each year 
then you know you're going to start having some of that inbreeding problem happening so remember diversity is the key to adaptation i feel i should have that on a t-shirt because i feel like i say this a lot when i'm talking about gardening to people but yeah diversity is the key to adaptation and it's the key to having a resilient garden that's going to be able to cope with anything that comes its way so the following year you want to grow out the seed that you've saved uh, from those plants that were particularly delicious or had those characteristics of what you were looking for and it, it's you know it's a good idea especially when you know you're kind of going into the second year to kind of have an idea of really what you're wanting to hone in on for your plants so is it that you want them to be maturing faster is it that you're wanting something that's longer to um, store are you just looking for something that is so freaking delicious every time you cook it your your friends and family are going bananas for it we have that with our purple Cherokees and um, one year I did a tomato sauce that was made only from purple Cherokees and it was amazing and I've not made it since because I've not had enough to um, to can just that that one variety but you know think about what what makes sense for you and for your family okay and uh, you know when it comes to the following year grow those seeds out that you saved that were great and you know try to save them from you know the healthiest plants uh maybe the biggest fruits if that's what you're looking for or the most uniform fruit um but try and save them um you know across a number of, of plants to help that diverse gene pool and then when you're growing out those saved seed you want to add in some other sources of seeds so uh, you might want to try growing seeds from a similar growing region uh, as an example so if you're in the pacific northwest you could try growing heirlooms or open pollinated variety that's popular in the uk because it's going to thrive and grow well in those cool wet conditions or you could switch it up and just try something totally totally different and the neat thing about this is it's it's all a great experiment you can just you know add in um some other plants to grow because they're fun or because they're neat or for whatever reason you like the color you like the shape um it's got something in there that you kind of want to try and that's going to help uh, maintain the genetic diversity of your plants so you want to keep adding in other sources of seeds each time you're growing these things out because this is going to ensure that you don't end up with that genetic depression and it helps ensure that you're not going to be creating a crop that's going to be at risk of failing if the climate or the climatic conditions change so you know each year it's just it's really a rinse and repeat process so each year you're going to keep selecting planting and saving seeds from those fittest plants in the garden those that taste the most delicious store the longest you know um you know have the short uh, days to maturity and you want to keep notes on the characteristics that you're selecting the seed for and you know whether you add that to the the label or the storage container or you know you keep copious notes in a garden journal just make sure that you, you kind of keep an eye on why you're selecting the variety because you know as each year comes by and you know those seed catalogs and stuff show up on your doorstep there's going to be new varieties that are coming available there's going to be new heirlooms that you're stumbling across there's going to be something new that you're going to want to try and you know you might be able to pair that with you know a certain you know characteristic like for some unbeknown reason i really want to create a blue banana squash i think that would be kind of cool um and I've, I've seen there's a grower who did it who's based here in um utah and he does a lot of land race gardening and i saw this picture on mother earth news and i was like man that looked really really cool and i kind of wanted to know like what did it look like on the inside was it blue on the outside and orange on the inside like what what is that so you know it, it's that you know scientist inside me it's just hitting all those all those buttons for wanting to try but there's there's different you know pumpkins for example that are um you know available and you know you could add some of those genetics into um the variety so maybe you've got a really cool squash that stores really long but it's it's not really sweet it doesn't doesn't really taste of much so adding in a variety that has got a really great flavor 
might help you know improve those land races that you're creating and having a better flavor so they've got all the benefits that you're loving and now they're starting to taste better and you can kind of hone in year after year on yeah this is what I'm I'm wanting it to taste like uh, you also want to make sure that you store the seeds that you're uh, saving from your previous years so you can add in a little bit of each year's um, you know plantings and seedlings as well as new sources of seed and there's, there's a couple of reasons for this so adding seed from uh, a couple of seasons previously helps to avoid like the genetics being totally thrown out of whack with an unusual growing season right so I said like last year we had a super long cold wet spring um, and then you know maybe this year we've only got a short spring and then it goes smack bang into summer if I only was to plant out the seeds um, from last year that I saved, they're probably going to be more adapted to growing in that colder, wetter spring. And they might not be very um, tolerant of like a super hot and drought conditions. So then the plants surviving a drought are going to be different from the plants that adapted uh, to the weather previously. So by growing out from, you know, a previous years can help uh, maintain those you know base genetics of being able to cope with what you're you know I'm quoting here air quotes like what a normal growing season and climate is for you uh, the, the other reason of course is um, you know getting through the seeds I mean you know I, having like tons of seeds stored is you know it's great um, but seeds do you know reduce in their germination rate as they get older so you want to be kind of refreshing your supplies as you're moving through this process also same for any seed that you're saving you want to try and grow some out at you know at least every you know three years or so so you can kind of refresh that supply when it comes to maintaining a land race garden you want to really be sure to share and swap you know your land race seeds with other local growers to really enhance that local adaptability of the seeds and you know when it comes to participating in a, you know a, a seed swap um, you need to be clear and ask if you can share you know land race or cross-pollinated varieties because some seed swaps don't allow it so I mentioned earlier that there was an online seed swap they would only accept heirlooms so some of the interesting kind of you know crosses that I'm working on and developing my land race I wouldn't be able to share those but I might have a neighbor who's like yeah sure you know I'd like some kale seeds that grow well yeah um you know I'll, I'll grow those so just kind of check with people beforehand um you could also try other local growers and see if they've got land race seeds and maybe they want to you know participate in just a, a land race seed swap um you know to share that local adaptability uh you also where you can want to try and grow out a, as big a number of plants from time to time so you can save seed from a number of different plants to help maintain that base genetic diversity and avoid that inbreeding problem right so you don't just want to be saving from one plant you want to try and save from from a few and you want to make sure that you're saving seed from multiple plants that have got different shapes different sizes colors textures dates to maturity flavors different um resistance all that good stuff because you know you want to be saving less seed from those plants which look like they've struggled to grow because if you're saving seed from these you know multiple plants with all these different traits you're going to be starting to really hone in on you know those things that you really like and have got those traits that you're looking for and it's also going to help maintain that diversity so if you get you know a, a weird weather thing happen or a weird pest or disease show up or I don't know something goes wrong with your soil or your watering you know you've still got some plants that are going to make it through and you might think that a land race garden means no work a no work garden I mean wouldn't that be great um, but <laughs> you still need to do some weeding here and there water on the schedule that suits you and your climate and you know be sure to keep your soil healthy and adding nutrients back into the soil with compost each year because like all plants a land race is going to do so much better with a healthy soil and practicing good crop rotation so we want to be moving our crops around we don't want to be growing the same thing necessarily year in yet 
year in and year out, <clears throat> excuse me, on, um, you know, that, that same land, because that's when you're going to start getting like a buildup of disease in that soil. And some diseases that happen in soil can take seven or even 20 years of not growing that crop in that area before they clear so that is something important to think about we want to be always practicing those good you know organic um you know practices there and make sure that you keep your seeds in a cool and dry uh place um glass jars are great they offer the best protection from pests and bugs even rodents you want to label your jars and containers as well as including the year that you save the seeds so you can help you know keep growing out some of that stuff but it's also so you know you can go back a generation so you know for some reason there might be um a plant that you know you kind of want you know you liked the year before but didn't do so well the following year maybe you want to go back to that generation and add in something different so a different variety perhaps and then see how that one uh comes comes out for you the following year and uh you know you might want to evaluate the plants or you know adding different varieties you know at each each step so you might want to go you know go back one year you know consistently and uh, see about what adding different varieties is going to create for you and uh you know there's there's just so much um that can be done with this type of gardening and it really is key to having you know a more consistent garden and I'm not you know into survivalism or anything like that um but there's there's a lot of that here where I live in Utah you know there's a lot of kind of you know preparedness that happens um you know I I don't know why you know there's there's a lot of it that happens they have these huge food stores and stuff um but you know it, it blows my mind that you know nobody really talks about you know growing in this way because this is right here how you have a a garden year after year that is going to continually grow and produce food for people and it's not something that's really um talked about so i thought that it was well worth kind of sharing this information with you and i know that we're we're coming up to an hour on this podcast so it's been a a long time but i really want to know from you what it's going to be your first crop that you want to develop into a land race so you know come on over to to facebook and let me know in the comments like what what would you like your first land race crop to be have you tried starting this or have you just begun with kind of cross pollinating i'd love to know i really love to hear about how people grow their own food and what works for you in your garden until next time i'm emma from misfit gardening and i hope that your garden and grows beautifully and have a wonderful week.